met a guy named William Rittenhouse back in 1996. I was on a mission trip, Sherry and I and Angie at the time, uh, was, uh, we were on a mission trip to Atlanta, to the Olympics, and we, uh, as at most mission trips, we stayed at a church, right? And uh, so we were staying at, uh, at Brother Rittenhouse's church, Jonesboro Baptist Church, just outside of Atlanta. And I got a chance to visit with, with him quite a little bit. And uh, he was an older gentleman at the time and has since gone home to be with the Lord. But a few years before that, Brother Bill had been a bomber pilot in World War II. He was a B-24 Liberator pilot, and he was flying missions over Romania uh, with his bomber and, and was bombing the oil fields over Romania when he was shot down. Now, before all this, Bill had been running from the Lord. He had felt a call on his life to do something for the Lord, and he had run from that and gotten into aviation and, and ended up in the Army Air Corps as a pilot. Well, he was shot down and taken to a prison camp. And while he was there, the Holy Spirit started speaking to him that there were people in that prison camp that needed to know about Jesus. And so just because he was a POW in a prison camp, the Holy Spirit didn't let him off on that. He said, this is where I've put you, and this is where I want you to serve. And so... He started holding services for the prisoners there in his prison camp, uh, the other officers that were taken there in, into that prison camp. And uh, so that was going okay, and, and uh, the commandant of the prison actually was a Romanian, and so he was allowing that to happen. So he thinks, okay, box checked. Well... Holy Spirit started speaking to him again. He said, you know, there's another prison camp across town full of enlisted guys, and they need to know about Jesus too. So Bill went to the commandant and secured permission. Every Sunday afternoon, he escaped from the prison camp through the sewer system, made his way across town over to the enlisted prisoner of war camp and held services over there. Now, the only caveat for that was, the only catch was that if he was, shot, if he was caught, he would be shot. Because the commandant said, I'm not going to know anything about this. You'll get me shot. And so every Sunday for about two years, Bill held services in that prison camp. After the war, Bill was released and he went back home and went to Texas, and in Texas, he uh, started pastoring a church. He responded to God's call on his heart to pastor. One day, a knock came at the door, and he didn't know who it was. Well, it was a Nazi. It was his Gestapo interrogator from the prison camp. He had been saved under Bill's ministry. He never told anybody about it because he would have been in trouble. He had followed Bill and found out where he was at in Texas because he wanted to join Bill's church. He wanted to serve with Bill. That Gestapo Nazi interpreter became a deacon in a Southern Baptist church in Texas. Now, does God have a, have a sense of humor or what? <laughs> that's what God can do to someone that's just willing to share the gospel where they're at. Bill Rittenhouse. Pretty amazing story, I thought. And I was thinking about that as we were, were uh, looking at these verses last week. And I just wanted to share it uh, with you. Turn in your copy of, to, of God's Word to Romans 10. Scott's already read this, but we're going to read it again just because it is a very profound passage of Scripture. Wes did an awesome job with it last week. And we're going to dig into it a little bit this week. So Romans 10, beginning in verse 13. While you're turning there, let's review just for a minute what we've learned so far in this series of, of Mythbusters. First, we learned we can't rely on praying a prayer once without any life change, without any true repentance and faith. It, that we can't rely on that for our salvation. That's insufficient. That it's got to be a change of the heart, not just words said. 
We also learned that God is more concerned with our faithfulness than he is with our happiness. How countercultural is that? Last week, Wes showed us from God's word that, that people that never hear the gospel never get saved. Unless anybody tells them they don't hear. So we're going to pick up there where, we're, where we left off. In verse 13 of Romans 10, it says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely have they, they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voices have gone out into all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Faith comes through hearing, and hearing from the word of Christ. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are the feet of those who share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul here states just a simple fact, just to reiterate one more time, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a great place to mention the obvious. If you have never called on the name of the Lord in repentance and faith for salvation, you are not saved. I got to get that right out there. There is no other way to heaven but calling on the name of Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. It's a fact that is repeated throughout Scripture. The first time we run into it is in Joel 2.32 where the prophet Joel is prophesying about the end times. Peter quotes this verse in his great sermon at Pentecost that ends up with the people there saying, Brethren, what shall we do to be saved? 3,000 people call on the name of the Lord for salvation. The gospel is for everyone. But Paul says there's a problem. You can't call on Jesus unless you believe in him. You can't believe unless you hear about him. You can't hear about him unless someone tells you. And no one will tell you unless they are sent. And as Southern Baptists, we hear this and we say, you know, we Southern Baptists, we do missions really well. We do missions well. We give our missions offering. And, and I commend you, by the way, in our vote to send half of our excess funds to foreign missions. That is awesome. I commend you for giving over and above our goals, the last mission offerings that we have, have given to. You know, we give to our mission offerings as Southern Baptists. We, we believe in missions. We train our missionaries. We send them to seminary. We send them to language school. We have some of the best trained missionaries in the world to go out and share the gospel. We support them while they're on the field. We give them food, housing, transportation, medical care, and schools for their children. That's why it takes money to send missionaries onto the field. We do missions well as Southern Baptist. The problem is we think, okay, we do that. Our box is checked. Box checked. Move on. What else? What else do we need to do? We do all that. So today, we're going to bust the myth. We're going to bust this myth that missions is only for professional missionaries. Now, missions is for professional missionaries, for career missionaries. We, we need those people. But if we think that missions is only for professional missionaries, then my responsibility is limited to praying for them and giving to them. But that's not what the Bible says. After all, if missions were for the professionals, then our box is checked. But that's not what the Bible says. We do need people that spend their lives among other people groups sharing Jesus. And not every one of us is called to do that. I get that. I get that, that not everyone is called to go to Africa or to Asia or to some other place and share the gospel uh, by living amongst those people. That's not all of our calling but just because we don't have a denominational appointment as a career missionary doesn't excuse us 
from being on mission. We are all on mission. So today, we're going to look at the what and the why and the how of missions for us. And if you're taking notes and you want to outline that, that's exactly how I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the what, the why, and the how of missions. So turn with me to Acts chapter 13 really quick, really quickly. In order to attempt to understand what Paul is talking about here in Romans 10 that we've heard several times, I want you to go on a trip with me, a mental trip. I want you to pack your mental bags just for a second as we do this. I want you to step into my time machine. We're going to go back to this church here that's talked about in Acts 13. It says in Acts 13, it says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Just think with me for a minute. Close your eyes if you need to and imagine yourself in a time before there was a difference really between clergy and laity. Back before there was a real difference between paid people doing our work and church people doing our work. That's really no difference anyway, by the way, but, but just imagine. Before when people said church, they thought of a building. Pretend you're in the town of Antioch, this dirt, dusty little town that's, that's at a, a crossroads where there's a lot of traffic coming through, and it's about A.D. 40. A little over a year ago, there were some men that came to town, and they shared the gospel with you, and you believed it, and you were saved. In fact, a lot of people were saved, several so many people were saved, in fact, that the rest of the town people started making fun of you. They called you a cult. Little Christ people. They shortened it to Christians. You Christians. You kind of like the sound of that, and you're kind of wearing that with, that's okay. I don't mind being called a Christian, because that's my Savior's name. You and your fellow disciples are or meeting, it's Sunday evening and it's time for worship. And people are starting to trickle in from their shops and maybe after they fed the master's kids and put his cat out and they're coming in. Remember, Sunday isn't a day off in the Roman Empire. So you're gathering and the sun's going down, it's starting to get dusk and the house is filling up and the courtyard around the house that you're meeting in is, is filling up. And normally you would be having a, a love feast right now probably, but you've been fasting. Your leaders have said, we need to start fasting and praying. God is wanting to do something with us. And as you're fasting and praying, and you probably take the Lord's Supper together like we just did, there's an impression that comes upon you starts coming upon the crowd that the Holy Spirit is putting there and someone gives voice to it first. You don't really know how, but someone says, you know, I think that the Lord is trying to call a couple of us to go out and share the gospel somewhere else. And so that leads to more fervent prayer and you pray and, and all of a sudden you understand as a group that this guy Saul and this guy Barnabas are two people that you need to send out and share the gospel somewhere else. And so you bring them up and you lay your hands on them and you pray for them and you send them away to share the gospel. And brother and sister, that's how we got the gospel because of that church meeting right there. If they had not gone out, if they had not shared the gospel, 
it would have never come to you because we're a direct result of that meeting that, that night. So you, you send them off to share the gospel, and you go to sleep that night knowing God is going to do something exciting. That is what missions is like. Being on mission begins with the church putting itself in a position to hear God speak, then God calling people to share the gospel with those that have never heard it, and it's realized in God's people being obedient in sharing. That is the what of missions. In case you didn't hear it, here's the what of missions. Missions is the responsibility of every church and every disciple to share the gospel with everyone who has not heard it. Missions is the responsibility, or missions are the responsibility of every church and every disciple to share the gospel with everyone who has not heard it. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So that is the what. What's the why? Why do we share it? We say, well, the Lord told us to. Okay, but I'm not letting you off that easy. That's true. Jesus gave us the great commission, and he told us to share it with everyone. But the why? Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Lord does not want anybody to perish. Everyone he desires to repent and follow Jesus. And we're the chosen vessel for the gospel. We are plan A, B, C, and D on that. We're the plan. There is no other plan. We are the preacher. The word preach in Romans 10, 14 means to proclaim. We hear preacher and we think of, of, of Pastor Michael or Pastor Wes or doing what I'm doing right now. But that's not what it's talking about. That is in, indeed preaching. But the word means to proclaim. You are the preachers of the gospel. We have to realize that. We are the preacher. The word for preach means to proclaim, to tell. So you are the preacher. Say, I'm the preacher. Well, that didn't sound very convincing. Say, I am the preacher. There you go. All right. That's a little bit better. That's right. Michael could do it very well. So he's convinced. We have the responsibility for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. That's on us. That is on us. Ezekiel chapter 33, turn there for me, please. We're going to do a little bit of Bible drill today. I'll try to keep it to a minimum, but unavoidable. Ezekiel 33. Back in the major prophets, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. If you get Daniel, you're going too far. Ezekiel 33. Beginning in verse 7. Ezekiel is prophesying to Israel and warning them. God has revealed God's judgment upon Israel for their idolatry. And in verse 7, God is speaking to Ezekiel. He says, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth, that's God's mouth, from my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. 
Now as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, saying, Surely our transgressions and our sin are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel had been appointed a watchman. The watchman sat on a tower, and when he saw a threat, he blew the trumpet. He sounded the alarm. God tells Ezekiel that he has a duty to warn Israel. They're in sin. And he says they are to turn back. Turn back, O wicked man. Because God does not want you to die. He wants you to repent. And if Ezekiel failed in his duty, God was going to hold him responsible for that. Say, oh, Brother Joe, that's Old Testament. Nice story, Old Testament. That doesn't apply to us, does it? Or does it? Romans 14, 12 says, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Brother and sister, every one of us is going to give an account for the responsibility that we have of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every one of us is going to stand before Jesus one day, and we're going to explain to him why we did not warn that person that he brought into our midst that they were going to die and go to hell without Jesus. We're going to give an account for that. Not for our salvation. Obviously, that is, if we're saved, we're saved. But we are going to give an account to Jesus for the responsibility that we have to share the gospel. The why of missions is we are responsible for what we have. We have been given a lot, and we are responsible for it. Paul knew that. Paul understood that this Saul that was sent out from the church at Antioch later was, was called Paul, right? This is Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he's writing to the church at Corinth. And he, he explains here kind of what his feelings are about this responsibility he has for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in, in verse 16, he's just talking about how he has a right to be supported as a missionary, but he hasn't availed himself of that right. And he says, I've used none of these things in verse 15, and then he says in verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul had a compulsion to preach the gospel. Have you ever been compelled to do something before? Like, I just can't help it. I have got to do this. You know, for me, it's banana pudding. I'm compelled to eat banana pudding if there's one in the refrigerator. I'm sorry. Sherry made one the other day. I just thought about that. But anyway, Paul was compelled he couldn't help himself. He says, I'm not boasting about it because I can't help but do it. Woe is me if I don't do it. I have got to preach this gospel. Now, who are the preachers? We are. That's right. We are. For I do this voluntarily, he says in verse 17. I have, if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me, what then is my reward? that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so that it is not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Paul says here that preaching the gospel is his own reward. You don't have to pay me. The gospel is its own reward. I have to preach it, he said. He said, I'm under an obligation. I have a duty. I've got this compulsion. I've got a stewardship of it. It's been given to me. I've got to do something with it. You see, Paul understood he had the most valuable item in the world. And he had the responsibility for that. He had the 
cure for sin? Who would love to see a cure for cancer? Who would love to see a cure for COVID? Paul had the cure for something much worse than that. He had the cure for sin. He had the key to heaven. He had the antidote for death. He did not want to see Jesus face to face and say, here you go. I had it. It's brand new. I never even opened my Bible to share it with anybody. It's just like you gave it to me. He didn't want to do that. But yet sometimes we act that way, don't we? I do. So that's the why. The why of not leaving ministry to the professionals is that we are individually responsible for what God has given us. He has given us the gospel. See, we don't have priests. God didn't just give Brother Michael the gospel and then he just dispenses the grace of that gospel how he sees fit. No, we are the priest. We are God's children. We all have experienced the gospel. We all have it. We all have received it. And we are responsible for giving it away. We're responsible to preach the real truth of the real gospel as presented in God's holy word. And there's places that you're going to go that there will never be a career missionary show up. It's probably never going to be a career missionary show up at your workplace. It's probably never going to be a career missionary show up at your club. It's probably never going to be a career missionary show up at your family gathering, unless there's one in your family. But you'll be there. You are the missionary to those environments, to those people. You are the missionary to whomever you're in contact with. So, that's the why. What's the how? How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, let's keep reading. Uh, Paul, Paul explains it to us here. In verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews, and to those under the law as under the law. As those not being under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without the law though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run the race all run with only, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. The very first thing that we need to do, we've already talked about, we have to realize that we are the missionaries. We have to buy into that. We have to realize that we are the missionaries. In verse 19, Paul said, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. Paul wanted to see everyone he met come to faith in Jesus Christ. He put himself as a slave to those people. He was a, a servant to those people. He wanted to win those people to Jesus Christ. So I have to realize that I'm the missionary. It's my responsibility. The second thing is I have to seek my mission field. He says to a Jew, I became like a Jew. To a weak person, I became like a weak person. To a Gentile, I became like a Gentile. He's saying, I had to learn the culture. I had to be able to speak the speak. I had to be able to, to get involved in these people's lives. If you want a good example of that, look at Paul when, it, when he goes to Athens and he walks around and he looks at all the statues of all these gods. And when he ends up being up at, on Mars Hill at the Oropagus, he says, hey, y'all have some really neat looking statues down here. And you've got one that says to the unknown God. 
Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about this God. Y'all are so interested in God, so I've got one I want to tell you about. So we got to preach the gospel to the Eropagus on Mars Hill. I mean, it's, it's, we have got to understand our mission field. We have to seek out our mission field. Paul says, I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some. We have to learn the culture. Learning the culture doesn't mean participating necessarily in all the culture, but it means learning the culture. We have to know what these people are about. We have to realize what shoes they're walking in. That doesn't mean that we participate in their sinful activities. Lost people act like lost people, don't they? But it means we have to understand where they're coming from. Paul didn't worship the gods, uh, the Greek gods, but he understood what they were about. He understood that they were worshiping. The next thing is that we have to make everything gospel-centered. Verse 23 says, And I do how many things for the sake of the gospel? All things for the sake of the gospel. We have to, to build the gospel into everything that we do. We have to look intentionally for those opportunities. We have to build those conversations in. Because let me tell you, they're not going to happen unless you make them happen. Very few people are going to walk up to you at your work or your club and say, man, I just really want you to tell me about Jesus Christ. It can happen, but it's more than likely going to happen when you start those conversations. You're going to have to learn how to start those conversations. And the fifth thing is we have to determine to finish well. He said, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? You can't tell it by looking at me now, but I used to run. I used to enjoy running. And I'd go on Saturdays to these races that they'd have locally, you know, and I'd run a 5K or a 10K, and, and I've run several different size races, worked myself up. I even ran a marathon one time. But I was never a runner. I was a guy that ran, and there's a difference. Because so I'd show up at the race, and you go to the table, you know, and, and you've either paid your money or you pay your money, and you get your little packet, and you got a T-shirt and a race bib in there, right? So you can go, you can put your T-shirt on, you pin your race bib on, and, you know, you're walking around there before the race, and, and you're a racer, right? You're a runner. Well, not really. You see the runners out there. You know, you, you see them. They're like that big around, and, and uh, when the gun starts, they're gone. I was a guy that ran, and I didn't compete really to win. I knew that I, I just wasn't going to win. I, I started out with the mentality, I'm not going to win. I came for the T-shirt, okay? That way I could go back and I could wear the T-shirt, and people thought I was a runner because they had the race T-shirt on, right? But, you know, they had already started cleaning the little water cups up by the time I crossed the finish line, so it was like last. Paul said, we don't run that way. We run to win. You know, as church members, it's like we just showed up for the t-shirt sometimes. It's like, I'm happy just with the t-shirt. Come here. That's better than 90% of the people out there, right? We don't get off that easy. Paul said, we run in a way to win. He's talking about the gospel here. When I see Jesus, I don't want to say I just came for the t-shirt. I want him to give me the prize. The prize for me is going to be hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. I gave you a responsibility and you handled that responsibility. Enter into your reward. That responsibility is the gospel that we've been handed. There's not another responsibility. It's the sharing the gospel with your family. It's sharing the gospel with your friends. It's sharing the gospel with your coworkers. It's trying to figure out how by any means, you can by all means save some. You're here to take some with you. We have to be intentional. We have to be intentional. So, 
what's your next mission? What is God calling you to do? You see, the implication behind all this is if we're here and we're breathing, God has a next mission for us. Whether we're eight years old or 98 years old, if we're here and we're breathing, God has a next mission for us. He's calling you to do something. And if you're not hearing it, if you don't know what that something is, it's because we're not listening. So here's the so what. First off, if you're here today and you've never experienced the life-changing, soul-saving, blood-washing gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to do that today because you're lost and you're going to spend forever in hell. And that's just plain and simple. If you have depended on something other than what we're talking about for your salvation, if you've depended upon your baptism or for your church membership or because your mama and daddy were good or because you're a good person, you're going to hell forever. Hell is going to be full of good people. So you need to take care of that today. We can explain how to do that today. All you have to do is repent, place your faith in Jesus Christ, call on him for salvation. And it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I am always concerned that we have people that have been church members for a long time that I will not see in heaven. So that's number one. Number two, if you're sensing God moving you to do something for the kingdom and you are not doing that, you are being disobedient. Delayed obedience is disobedience. So what has God been speaking to your heart about? What mission is he sending you on? If he speaks to you, you're responsible for obeying that. Everyone will give an account of yourself or herself to God. How many of you know who Leon Spinks is? My age and older. Okay, yeah. Well, I read this morning that Leon Spinks died, 67 years old. Leon Spinks was a 1976 gold medal Olympic boxer. But that's not his claim to fame. His claim to fame is, in 1978, in his eighth professional boxing match, he, not, he won, he didn't knock out, but he won the heavyweight title of the world by defeating Muhammad Ali. His eighth professional boxing match. And he says, no one thought I could win, but I, I, I watched the, the films on this. I watched him on film, and I knew I could beat him. And so, for two years, he trained to beat Muhammad Ali. He was intentional. Every waking moment, I would imagine, Leon Spinks spent thinking about, what can I do to beat Muhammad Ali? Folks, let me tell you, we don't have big enough goals for the gospel. We think this is normal. We think that because there's a few of us in here, that that's okay. When, as Scott said, when we go out those doors, there are literally thousands of lost people without having to go very far. Thousands of lost people who don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our mission field. What are you going to do about it? Let's stand. Our musicians come. I don't know what the Holy Spirit has spoke to you about. But I do know he spoke to you about something if you've been listening. Now's the time to do something about that. Pastor, if you'd come up front. Our pastor's here. Maybe you need to be saved this morning. If you need to be saved this morning, don't walk out that door without it. Don't walk out that door being lost. You're responsible because you've heard it.
God has spoke to your heart about something that he wants you to do, you need to surrender to that and you need to start doing it because the time's short. For the rest of us, how are we going to spread the gospel when we go out those doors today? Let's pray. Father God, I pray your forgiveness over me for being sloppy and lazy in my Christian life. I pray, Father, that you'll forgive me for, for running across multiple people and not sharing your eternal life-giving gospel with them. Father, forgive me for that. Father, I pray that you will just speak to our hearts. I pray that you will impart upon us that particular thing that you'd have us to do, that particular person that you'd have us to share with. And Father, I pray you give us such an, a compulsion for that, that you would not leave us alone, that we would not rest, that we would just be saying, woe is me if I do not share the gospel with that person, that situation. Father, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.